We're in the back of the ute today at Phoenix Park in Balan because it is Regenerate 2024 with Ray Archuleta, but happen to have Rachel Treasure in the back of the ute. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's been um, a long time getting to this point because this is Rochelle and SRF's first conference. So what draws you here? Number one, the people, because when you gather with uh, like-minded people or people that are emerging, there's just such a, a buzz and a support network. And we've come from all over, from myself, Tasmania, and there's some lads from Townsville even. So it's really exciting. Yeah, so you've had a fair trip. Uh, so I may as well mention that the pups in the back here because they're gnawing away on their bones. <laughs> um, so, so what have you done? You've come from Tasmania to, you've done loads of traveling, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I have. <laughs> um, it's my first trip away um, after a health crisis and my children turning into adults. And so I thought I'll return to my grassroots, which was taking dogs on the road. And I bred a litter of Kelpies. And this is Usman Kelpwaja. I'm a cricket fan, so Uzi. And then I'm a country music fan and I've got Dolly Pupton. <laughs> and I thought there's no better way of bonding than a road trip. So I've been from um, down south in Tassie all the way to Canoundra to hang out with some Kelpie mates that trial and train dogs on stock camp. Is that in New South Wales? Yes, Canoundra, yeah. New South Wales, and then I meandered back down to Rochelle's neck of the woods and then here I am. So it's, it's brilliant. So have you heard about Ray before? Yes, I have, definitely. I've been in the regenerative space since about 2009 when my daughter was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and other health conditions and as a mother I kind of found that link between chemical agriculture there were sprays all around us when I was in my um, pregnancy phase and then we just noticed so many different things unfolding in our community Colin Sice visited Tassie in 2009 it was like a light switch went on in my head and that I just have not stopped moving forward in that realm and discovering more and more and learning mostly about myself so what are you doing on farm? Because you've got a farm, haven't you? Well, yes, I, I would say I'm a bit of a sheep Uber driver. <laughs> so I, um, we've, the, the base farm is Ripple Farm Landscape Healing Hub, which is my farming partner's um, farm. That's 100 acres. But then I have separate blocks and I will graze animals as a, um, it's almost like a community service if you like because there's covenant land that's been locked up and left and it's going backwards so we're trying to stimulate the biodiversity by bringing our animals on so we run Dexter cattle because they do really well on weeds which we, <laughs> we know are just plants um, and they do super well on that and then I have um, uh, aloe burn pole merino sheep well, they're from west of Wagga at Boree Creek and they're a plain skin merino but they're good carcass and good fibre so we produce meat and wool and then we have um, free range chicken eggs and all of that farm product goes through an online farmers market called Tasmanian Produce Collective so yeah I, I literally deliver food two customers out of the back of the ute, out of the back of this ute. Very good. I was going to say, that's direct farm gate to customer. It's uh, TPC, we have delivery hub in Hobart um, and in the north and, and the, the, it's, it's on the Open Food Network's order system and so, which is an, it's a national um, platform where, where you can invoice customers via this system. And so we have a statewide distribution system and we're, mo we're a not-for-profit and we most, we're most we all volunteers, basically. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. How long has that been going for? Uh, it's probably been going about three to four years off the top of my head. And um, yeah, and so it's a fortnightly delivery and we have everything from beautiful cheeses to, to uh, of course, the Ripple Farm products that, that I create. Um, Everything from breads to preserves, you name it, whatever's in season, we will deliver to our growing customer base. It's such a huge demand. Yeah. yeah. So we, we like to say um, that we're building the plane as we're flying it. Um, but we really, we literally deliver food. I deliver food in a hardware store car park, sometimes under the cover of darkness. So it's like we're dealing in kale <laughs> out, of the, out of the back of the ute because we're just trying to bust open that 
supermarket stranglehold. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What a good idea. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So going back to your grazing, so you're grazing common ground, are you? Is, is that sort of... No, it's covenant ground partly. It might be someone who's had a tree change and they're setting up a vineyard, but they don't realise that landscape needs managing and not all landscape can be managed by mowing it. Right. So I'll be invited to take my mob of sheep and we'll graze that using time control grazing and yeah. so at the moment my my sheep have a sea view <laughs> and on the east coast of Tassie and we're repairing landscape um, the, uh, the gentleman is from Switzerland and during COVID he decided to buy land in Tasmania so uh, you know unfortunately we've lost such a connection to land that it becomes something that somebody owns but there's no caretaking yeah. so I've been privileged enough to have enough Tassie networks to be able to just say let's bring the sheep around again and and try and settle that landscape and let it know that that there's someone there caring for it yeah I love it and this is what I really want to um, almost start myself with just it's you're sort of droving but it's in more of a controlled way so you just have a mob of sheep or cattle and you offer your services so they are walking fertilizers yeah and and knockdown is natural rather than with chemicals yes um, and i know that they're doing it in america but it's not really taken off in australia no it's a lot of work but for me i love it because my working dogs are my everything i love low stress stock handling and we've only got small mobs i mean we we're not big we're not producers we we're using these animals to caretake land and I learn every block I go on to um, I learn from it so it is it's and I'm hoping it will take off particularly for young people that yeah. want a start in agriculture and they don't know how to start but if you see land that's just overrun you get yourself some beautiful quiet animals which are the Dexters and the yellow burn palmerinos they're just so quiet and handling as well so it is, there's potential everywhere. So do you get an older mob? So you're not breeding, are you doing? Yeah, we're breeding okay. as well. So, um, but fortunately we've got Ripple Farm as the home base. So they, they, the cattle can do their thing there. Um, the sheep, they're just so cruisy and such good mothers. Um, they're selected on maternal instinct, the sheep. So, um, and we have... <laughs> <laughs> Never tie your pup too long. No. <laughs> They're a bit klutzy there at that gawky kind of pre-teen stage. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we, it's, it's one of those things where the blocks of land I'm now familiar with, so we'll return to each block. Um, yeah, and so are the, I call them my sheep peeps. My sheep peeps are quite familiar with, no. with it as well, so. And have you, you've seen an improvement then, obviously. Uh, in the some land. in some cases, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's sometimes it's, sometimes it's just a little bit early, but it's been lovely because I'm I've been able to showcase to the landowners what's possible mm. using just grazing, and then we we get a lovely byproduct of meat from that. You know, so um, the the glitch in the system is the abattoir system. Like many places, Tasmanian abattoirs were bought up by massive corporations and then shut one by one they just kept shutting them and shutting them so often the only option as a grower is to ship your animals off across Bass Strait and you have no control as to their well-being. So do you know why they did that because that mystifies me with the abattoirs? I'd say it would be an economics only viewpoint okay. yeah it would be it's foreign ownership so again this governance where we're not protecting smaller producers and smaller yeah. systems. So it just yeah. it astounds me that they shut it down rather than selling it? No, they're shutting it down to build one kill facility. And I say, yeah, oh. so, so it supplies the major corporation, oh, okay. like the supermarket chain. So it's increasingly difficult. I mean, as a producer, I would rather have my animals um, just dropped in the paddock and yeah. slaughtered, which we've done using mobile abattoir systems but he's not accredited so you can't sell that meat yeah. we could only have it for our family yeah. so there's some real glitches in the system that cause animal welfare issues across yeah. straight down the line which yeah. is why i'm tenaciously sticking to this um yeah and and hoping that our local abattoir can keep ticking along yeah, yeah. yeah well, the supply is, mm. it's gonna 
Yeah. Mm. Now you're a mad dog trainer. When I say mad, I mean crazy and, and excited about it. Not, not <laughs> well, you know, crazy cat ladies frighten me. So, but um, <laughs> sorry to the crazy cat ladies <laughs> listening. But no, I've always loved um, low stress environments with livestock and if you have a off your head kind of kelpie then that's not going to help so mm. yeah <laughs> sorry she's just there that actually that's one of our cows sorry that she's oh, chewing right. on there yeah <laughs> so byproduct too nose to tail uh, use of the animal yeah, for absolutely. sure for sure so um and they've even got um preston ridge free rain pig um, treats, you know, so from our Taz Produce Network. Yeah. So um, my friend met me with some treats on the, at the ferry at the boat. So oh. this is another lovely aspect is the community sense yes. that so we've got berry farmers who are friends. They're very nice. <laughs> and um, so there's a whole whole cohort of us that ha produce different things. But we if we produce the same thing, we still support one another. It's collaboration, not competition mm. so it's reinventing this mindset and yeah, system absolutely. anyway back to dogs <laughs> yeah so um so, well when did you start training when you were little or uh n no i i watched sheep dogs being mistreated uh. when i was little to the point where it was horrific uh, and so then when i was a journalist for abc rural in gippsland i met a dog trainer there, Paul McPhail, who's still training Kelpies, and I that would have be that would be over 20 years ago. And so then I, you know, teamed up with um, Paul and facilitated schools for him in different regions. And then Ian O'Connell's another legend. This is Ian O'Connell bloodline. So yeah, so I've always um, just chipped away and learnt from the dogs and learnt from the livestock. It's lots of fun. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully they'll behave here at Phoenix Park if yeah, they. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They've done well so far. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so an exciting time for you as well with your book writing. <laughs> and talk us through how um, you started because you wrote. Jillaroo. And yeah. oh, was that your first? Jillaroo was the first. Oh. Book. Okay. Yeah. I haven't stumbled over that. No. Yet. So how did that all come apart? My. Grandma was a farmer and a writer down in Tassie. She's not the, you know, lady that stays in the kitchen. She was out shooting rabbits, you know, catching fish, milking cows. Um, and she wrote a lot of stories in the 50s. And then later on when she grew her children up, she started writing again in the 70s. And I just thought that's what you did. You wrote stuff and it got published. Oh, wow. So I studied journalism, communication. Um, I studied agricultural business admin as well. And that took me to different farms being a journalist and that I knew I wanted to write a novel. So I wrote Jillaroo in, it was, came out in 2002 and I'm, so I'm still going strong writing. Um, yeah, so, so I've got um, Jillaroo and then, and then, you know, several novels and a few non-fiction so including down the dirt roads which was a bit of a biography about losing family farm to ex-husbands because of my gender yeah so some some really um common themes about women missing out in agriculture because of their gender maybe not currently but certainly in my day that was happening a lot yeah yeah. And so what's your book now? So my book is coming out in May, it's uh, May 2024 and it's called Milking Time and it is about cows and the cosmos. So it's set in Tasmania and I've drawn a lot from my experience with the food system. So my character is Connie Mulligan, she's a dairy farmer's daughter and she's just detests what's happening with her family farm with her community so her dad runs the farm like a factory system and the state is getting bought out by corporations so she she's got to overcome some serious challenges and um, lift her town out of the mire and so it's it's told with heart and humor but it's quite a complex book and it's got a lot of um, I guess, you know, for want of a better word, a lot of spirituality, because I think when you come into the regen space, so much of it is uh, knowing that you're greater than just this little egoic meat bag that you walk around in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> never heard it put like that. Yeah, before. well, you know. Yeah, it is true. I'm a 
bag. <laughs> yeah, meat bag, meat bag, a breathing meat bag. You know, but and that's the thing. Like we get so caught in our heads, and we have to come into our hearts, which is one of you know natural intelligence farming kind of deal. Hello, Usman. <laughs> oh, don't lick. That's a bit gross. I know what you've been eating. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's a very exciting time with milking time. It's got the cover. It's so pretty. It's out for Mother's Day, but I'm hoping it's a bit of a Venus flytrap that people will go, oh, I'm going to dive into this. And when they open the pages, they're in for a ride because it's about awakening to ourselves and to our food systems and also to, you know to, to making well like I say in the book milking this time of your you know of your life milking yeah. it for all it's worth yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really mm. so it's very exciting yeah yeah, yeah. Amazing. Mm. and you um, bring in some of the regenerative principles and things as well don't you with a lot of your books absolutely are uh, increasingly as I've grown I mean I was a young woman when I started writing and so as I've learnt and had crisis and, and challenges and unravelings and it... Oh. Stop licking your mother. Stop licking your mother. <laughs> Whoa. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's one of those things that um, as I've learnt about the regenerative space, I've woven it into story because story is the most powerful change agent to mindset. And because people are feeling with their hearts mm. and their souls when they read story and so... Um, White Horses was inspired by Ian and Di Haggerty over in the West. So I set that book in the West. And a lot of it is about female um, reclam reclamation. So we're reclaiming our feminine power. That's not, it's not a gender issue. It's just like recognizing that Mother Earth has a female frequency. Um, women have been, well, like myself, we, I was in a house with a, you know, pregnant with my next chart with my child and there's sprays all around me agricultural sprays and it's up to you know I feel like it's time for women to rise up and say this this is not good enough you know we are in at we're at a crossroads and we really need to um, stand up and there's a very funny way in milking time how the women fend off the the uh yeah the, the well not so much the enemy but the old system so yeah. yes it's... oh i'm gonna have to read this book then <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah sounds amazing well i really hope um, it's lovely to meet you and yes. i really hope uh, we have well we will have a fantastic time and uh, that you get to meet and see everybody who's on the mainland because you're in, in tasmania aren't you so yes do you get off the rock <laughs> uh, well um I, I i went to ground for a about two, two and a half years because I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a couple of surgeries and then I went through the whole, I call it the Chernobyl experience. But the first time I got off the rock was to go and see Zach Bush and he talked about how Mother Nature absolutely flourishes after adversity. So I just thought, right, that's my cell, that's my nature. I'm going to flourish after this adversity. So I'm, I feel like um, it was, you know, I caught up with Rochelle and... Um, so many people there and so this is my next little holiday and just yeah oh and I had been to see Nicole Masters as well in Orange so there's a real clan there's a real yeah. tribe and we're getting bigger and we're getting louder and braver I think yeah absolutely. Yeah. and this is the whole point of this event was that we go home and say this is what we're going to do not at the end of the event go well yeah but how does it apply to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the facilitation side of it is, is a little bit different this time yeah it's exciting I can't wait yeah, fantastic thank you so much for spending some time in the back of your youth well I know I put the blanket down for comfort <laughs> <laughs> it's been great yeah thank it's been so lovely much. chatting thank you Beautiful. You poor thing, I feel like, oh, you've got a tissue in the car. <laughs> no, I just remember, I, I was trying not to go blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> can you turn that bit down on the mic? Oh, I can hear it's a stuffed up. I've got some um, powdered vitamin C, if you need some powdered vitamin C, and like an immune tonic as well, it, which tastes oh, cool. really gnarly. It's... oh. Oi. I'll put it back up there then because it's not for chewing. <laughs> You're getting <laughs> cheeky. Sounds...